everybody has heard about uh, the Olon 4, the Maloclinic protocol and the Maloclinic breach, but I believe that most of you think that this is something started about two, three or four years ago. And that's what I tried to go through history a little bit here in 20 minutes. First of all, we used to have these, um, these structures which are subperiosteal structures. And then we moved the result, the success rate was not so good. So we moved into bone grafting and we did those um, uh, big bone reconstructions. Um, and we used to, uh, to place six to eight implants. Unfortunately, bone grafting cannot be done in every individual. Uh, people with uh, severe osteoporosis or very old people, it's very difficult to, to do these um, um, maxillary reconstructions. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, some people will just refuse to do it because they are afraid. So they have the dangers and uh, they'll be okay with them. So we found a need to change that and to be able to introduce a new system, a new technique that would be more reliable uh, and also could be done without grafting. And that the all on for um, surgical protocol was born. I, you have to understand that uh, a lot of people confuse all on for and malloclinic protocol. Malloclinic protocol is the umbrella and underneath is the surgical protocol, which is now the all on for and the, 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 the mallow bridge. And some people think that the, the, the all on four needs, you know, it's about cutting the bone, reducing the bone. It's not true. That is the mallow bridge protocol, not, nothing to do with the all on four protocol. And lately, we actually been avoiding bone grafting in the maxillas by using um, zygomatic implants. So, in fact, even when you do not have bone in the maxilla, by the cases that um, our colleague has just showed, in fact, we don't need to graft. We can just get away, as long as we have zygomas, uh, because unfortunately, sometimes we don't, but as long as we have zygomas, we do not actually need the bone in the maxilla. What we need is to separate the two cavities, the oral and the nasal. So what is exactly this story about the malloclinic uh, rest uh, restorative protocol? Well, it's all about delivering a fixed bridge of high quality anesthetics, avoiding bone grafting, having a high success rate. High success rate today is above 90%. In this case, we're talking about 98%. And it's about maintenance. Everybody here has mentioned the importance of maintenance. Success rate is not after one year, it's after 10 years. That is uh, very important to know. And allow the patient to have immediately teeth. This is important when we do these big reconstructions. In the old days, we used to reconstruct with bone graft, the maxilla, tell the patient to stay three months without teeth. That's not acceptable unle unless the patient is retired and try to bring low cost to the rehabilitation. Low cost to the rehabilitation is not cheaper implants or cheaper teeth is getting away from grafting. Grafting is more than 50% of the total cost. So let's talk about the evolution. Actually, it all started in 1990. And that's a long time ago. And as a matter of fact, it all started before 1990 and as a matter of it started in 1989 with the protocol of immediate load, single teeth and small bridges. Only when we were very comfortable with success of the protocol of immediate load in single teeth and small bridges, 1989, we were so comfortable with the success that we asked the question, why not going further and instead of having two, three teeth in a bridge, why not 12? So in 1990, we had the challenge. Can we deliver a full mouth rehabilitation without grafting? From 1990 to 1993, we basically studied the mechanics of it. So it was nothing clinical, just the mechanics. How, what kind of structure do we need to deliver in terms of implants to be able to support a bridge of 12 teeth? And the second question, what kind of bridge 
shall that be? In 1993 was the first case. And the first case, as you could see, is a case that we could probably place six implants straight. But it was a case that we had to find. And this is actually a family member. <laughs> we have to use a, a family member. So I could place six implants, shorter implants in the back, probably like seven millimeters or so. But we needed to try this. So that was the first case, and it was a success. The success of this case did not tell us that the protocol was perfect. What it told us is that it can be done. So it is not true that it cannot be done, because in those days, as you can imagine, uh, this was completely crazy. This was, this was against the rules. So in 1996, we went further. We said, well, we've done this in the mandible, so we have cases in the mandible that we don't need to graft in anymore. And all of a sudden, said, why can't we also do this in the maxilla? And we went to the maxilla, and we did exactly the same thing with the products and the surgical techniques we had at the moment. And it was a completely fiasco. From 98% success rate, we, we went down to 70% success rate. Why was that? Because the maxilla and the mandible, they are different. The mandible, normally we have dense bone, very important for primary anchorage, especially. In the maxilla, we have very soft bone, especially older patients. And that was the big problem. So we had to figure out how could we do this, because a protocol is something that we can apply to the most of the population, not only for 2 or 3%, because that's not a protocol. That's a case. So we went down and said, OK, what is wrong with this? Well, basically, what was wrong with that is that we had soft bone, and we could not anchor the implants. So we have to change the surgical protocol. Well, then we introduced this new thing called bicortical anchorage. We actually perforated the sinus, and we wanted to place the implant inside the sinus, through the cortical of the sinus. And also, we would like to use the cortical, the residual crest. So we would have two corticals, the residual crest cortical and the sinus cortical. That's called bicortical anchorage. Also, we would like to expand the bone, not to cut. So we would do something called under preparation. We prepare the osteotomy at two millimeters, and then we'd like to place a four millimeter implant. On the other hand, we'd like to do something which is cracking the sinus floor. Cracking the sinus floor means that as the implant goes into the sinus floor, we do not want to cut the sinus floor. We want to crack it and cause a reaction from the body, which, is, which forms a callus formation. So we had all these uh, great ideas. We want to use a two millimeter drill all the way down, cross the two corticals, and then place an implant. But you see, we did not have the implant to do that, because that implant needed to have an apex of two millimeters that could fit in the osteotomy of two millimeters and expand without cutting. That apex had to go through the cortical of the sinus, crack it without cutting. And that implant on top of all this had to add threads on the head so that we could engage the cortical on the, on the residual crest. And we did not have that product, so we developed this product in 1998. It's called the Noble Speedy Implant. It's got threads from top to tip, apex to cut through and push to, to go through the sinus, the sinus floor, not to cut, to push and engage all the way, engage on the cortical of the sinus, engage on the cortical of the residual crest. And this was the first implant of its kind, an implant that was pushing the bone and being at the bone level. At the time, of course, they almost killed me because this was making some stupid ideas. But you see, in life, the stupid ideas, that's the advancement. Because intelligent ideas, everybody has them. So then, we started at this time also the retrospective study of the mandible. Although we started the first case in 1993, but only in 1998, actually, we start collecting the cases to publish. Why didn't we publish from 1993? Because from 1993 to 1998, we were constantly changing the protocol. We needed to make it better all the time, so we cannot use it 
as a publication. In 1998, we stabilized the protocol, although it's never stabilized, but basically lines are stabilized. And then we start picking up the cases to publish later. In 1999, we of course were not happy with the result of the aesthetics because most of these bridges were acrylic bridges with long teeth, not looking nice, because when you do not have teeth, you have to introduce the papilla element in the bridge. Because even if you have young patients that you can do it the first day, in four or five years' time, there will be a black triangle there and your tooth will become square. And if you lose bone in height, your tooth will become longer and longer. And then you have the horse smile, which you don't want. So we introduced this, the malotonic bridge, which basically is the tooth needs to be the size of a natural tooth. Whatever is needed to fill up the space, the papilla, the soft tissue needs to be also a fake papilla and soft tissue. By introducing also foreign implants, we had a problem of resistance because now we have cantilevers. Cantilevers, we need an infrastructure that can, can take that load of the cantilever. So the new bridge was always a full bridge, always with individual crowns of cement, cemented on top of the bridge, and other, other things that I don't have time to talk about now. But the major breakthrough was that we ran away from the normal bridge, which the long teeth, to a bridge which was always full, meaning half, half a shoe or, or a horseshoe, always, always with ceramic or acrylic teeth and always with the papilla and pink tissue. Because of this, we needed space. We needed space to make this bridge resistant. We needed space to have the transition zone because the patient now, when they smiled, we could not see the transition zone between the false gingiva and the true gingiva. And because of this, we had to start cutting the maxilla and, re and reducing the size of the maxilla in order to have an aesthetic smile. It's nothing to do with our own four. In 2001, we started, the, we stabilized this, the protocol of the all on four pro surgical protocol on the maxilla, and we started to pick up the cases for later publication. In 2003, we launched the study because we did not want to launch a study of one or two or three years. We wanted to wait at least five years to launch the study. Remember that this was a major breakthrough and we could not afford to make a major bust. We had to make sure that we were saying the right thing. So we had to wait all this time and I tell you, it was not easy. In 2003, we published and at that, that same time, after eight agonizing years of trying to convince Novacare that this is a good idea, Novacare eventually said, yeah, you might be right. So we joined together, Nolan 4 was released to all the surgeon dentists around the world. And in the beginning, 2003, very few people believed on it, and today it is what it is. In 2004, we were not happy with the way we're doing the maxilla because with, to do the, the Olon 4, you need, absolutely need some bone. So we had to do and, do, and change the zygoma surgery Today, we have, uh, there's a new zygoma surgery with a new zygoma protocol, which was published later on. In 2007, we published the Noble Guide with the Olon 4. 2011, we, we launched this 10-year follow-up on the mandible and the five-year follow-up in the maxilla. So what is so special about the Mallow Clinic Bridge? Well, basically, I already explained to you, it's a bridge that always a one-piece bridge, always can be full acrylic, metal acrylic or metal ceramic. It always uses false papilla and soft tissue and uses a cantilever if needed. This is the new bridge, that's what we call the malaclinic bridge, and on the right we have the traditional bridge. The traditional bridge on the right, you cannot have cantilevers because she will not support it, she will break. It doesn't have enough resistance, so you need more implants. It doesn't have papilla, so therefore that lip must must not go over the, tr the emergence profile of the tooth, otherwise you'll see everything is happening. And also, the patient needs to have a lot of bone, otherwise those, those teeth will be two centimeters high. 
means that we do not do that anymore. Now we do this all the time. So what is the Olon 4? Everybody knows about this. Four implants placed in a full arch reconstruction, angulated 40, 45 degrees. In fact, we do not need implants in the posterior of the mouth. That's a dogma. It's wrong. We do not need implants in the posterior of the mouth. And of course, we have very high success rate. We're talking about 98% success rate. Why do we do it? Because we want to avoid the, avoid the bone grafting. That's the major reason. The major reason is to avoid the bone grafting. When do we do that? If we have a lot of bone, there's no need for the all on four. You place six implants parallel, that's easy. Easy place. Why should you make life difficult for you? But if you do not have enough bone, please, before going to bone grafting, consider yourself the option of inclining the implant and avoiding bone grafting. You're much better off. Higher success rate, delivered the same day, much better for the patient. But you need some bone. If you do not have bone, we developed the all on four hybrid. Hybrid because there's an implant placed in the maxilla and another one placed outside the maxilla. And if you have no bone at all, you go for double zygoma, bilateral. We have a video now to show you uh, some procedures. Uh, this is a 3D, so put on your special glasses. This is a patient with uh, not so much bone as you, as you will see just now. Uh, we actually do not have any bone from the canine backwards, but as I said to you, we do not need it. This is a normal uh, flap procedure. She had two teeth in the front that we could not use it. You can see that on the, on the area of the seventh uh, tooth on the right side, the bone is so soft that it is actually there is a, a connection with the sinus. Maybe an, an old extraction that went, did not go so well. So, and because she's got too much bone, we remove a little bit. Um, as you see, we need to have a aesthetic, beautiful outcome. This is not about having implants. We do not remove bone because we want to place implants. We remove bone because we want a beautiful aesthetic outcome. So the first drill is an osteot. This is the mallow guide. It's a parallel guide to place parallel implants. It's not designed for the, for the inclination of implants. That's a guide. Parallel laser marks to place parallel implants, but you can also use it as inclination. You can see that from the canine posterior, we do not have bone, but who needs it? You just incline the drill and you perforate in a 45 degree angulation towards the front, and then you end up placing a cantilever of one or two teeth because when you, when you incline this way, you gain a lot of space. The guide is important because you always need to have a guiding, something to guide you. This is, there is no guidance on this maxilla because there's no teeth. If there was one or three teeth, we could guide ourselves through the teeth, but not with this. This is a special implant that will give you bicortical anchors. In this case, the tip of the implant will be actually in the nose. These implants go up to 25 millimeter. This is the speedy external connection, and it's very important to have threads on the head of the implant so we can engage both corticals. These, these patients are normally, the difficult cases are the, uh, the above 55, 6 year old females that the bone is very soft. So we need to make sure that we engage bicortically by inclining the drill. You can see that this is the 18 mark, so we're probably placing like 18 millimeter implants here. These drills uh, have, the, have the sequence of the of the of noble biocare. These are the what they call the the um, the twist drills, uh, um, st step step uh, step drills. This is the implant. You see that the apex allows you to expand and then the threads go all the way to the, to the top. And we place it sideways, so the head will come around first premolar. Be be uh, below that head, maybe you have half a millimeter of bone. 
which is more than enough. As a matter of fact, we can even do that without any bone on the, on the head of the implant. These are the 30 degree abutments. It's very important to place the abutment with the guide in place because the guide shows you where the internal aspect of the bridge is and the handle of the abutment tells you the prosthetic screw channel. So this way you can play around with the angulated abutment until you have the channel in the right way. So then you have to, uh, of course, connect the abutment to the implant. And after placing the posterior implants and you do the anterior implants, we don't have a lot of space here. And you can see bone is so soft that literally I push the drill in. I don't even drill. And that's in the front. Imagine what, how soft the bone is in the back. So obviously we do not use any more drilling, just a two millimeter drill inside the nose and then the other drills only for the first two, three millimeters. Then you place an implant that will be one millimeter inside the nose, looking for bicortical anchorage. The implants are always placed palatal to the normal alveoli of the teeth. So that's one on the right. And we should, and normally with these implant and this type of technique, normally we reach always more than 30. Typically we reach 50, sometimes even more. Then we place a multi-unit abutment and we will go to the other side. There's a little space here between, uh, between the, um, the incisal canal and the alveoli. It's not much, but this implant has a wonderful thing which is expands the bone, it does not cut. So by expanding the bone, you can actually place a four millimeter implant in a four millimeter crest without actually exposing anything. So there we go. The other drills, just basically the first one or two millimeters, because the implant will do the rest. That's the three, two drill there, right there, just one or two millimeters. And then we just place the implant. And it's very, very close. You can see that the bone is so soft that it moves around. But as the implant goes in, it becomes more and more and more stable until it actually blocks at uh, 30 newtons now. Blocked at 30 newtons, you can see here the machine. Now it's 50 newtons and it will block at 50 newtons normally just by reaching the, the bone. At this moment, we can actually push a little bit more. Normally the implant blocks at 50 newtons when it gets in, in contact with the cortical of the nose and then we just push it a little bit more to get that uh, bicortical really anchorage. Well then, you got the case done. A case like this will take about 30 to 45 minutes to do it. And um, as you can see, it, you do really do not need so much bone. It's a mistake to think that you need to fill up the mouth with bone and place 20 implants. That's an absolutely mistake. There's no reason whatsoever to do that. Now you suture, and of course, totally dentless patients are totally without papilla. Because papilla, soft tissue papilla, is only exists if you have a bone papilla. These patients will do, do not have, and those that have because you did extractions, they will lose throughout the time, and you'll have a flat soft tissue surface, and you have the black triangle to haunt you. So we, by doing thousands of this since 1993, we learned one big lesson. We do not play around. It is true that 1% or less of cases we can actually place use the soft tissue natural papilla to make these cases, but that's less than 1%. And you know, when you do 10,000 of these cases in one year, you do not want to go back and redo 9,500 bridges because it comes out of your pocket. So we have to be serious about this and start uh, by, by being very, very honest with the patient. That's the impression and then from, from here goes to the lab and of course the lab will develop all this work which we do not have obviously time to, to, um, to, sh to show. We, do the, we just protect the abutments so that the soft tissue, this will take another three or four hours before we actually come back and place the bridge. This bridge is a full acrylic bridge, completely flexible. It's very important to be flexible. Don't think that it should be rigid. It's a mistake to be rigid. It should be flexible. And then we place this as a first provisional bridge. Uh, we always screw retained. 
um, this is something since 1993 we do not cement full bridges I think it's a huge mistake they need to be retrievable they need, we need to take care of them now and then and we screw retain them and then from now we can move after four or six months we can move into a better more beautiful bridge that papilla there will stay there for another eight years without moving anything thank you very much